Now tonight's news regarding such items as awareness, reality, games, and some really cheap shots at thinking. No. <laughs> the mind is like a mirror, and as with any mirror, you can look out or you can look in. The mind is like a mirror, but the reflective nature of the glass men normally use to cover and protect it can prove for some a visual impairment. On the planet of awakened conspicuousness, they have no word for metaphor. On their sister star of supreme self-evidence, they, they don't even have a word for mind. And don't forget that the drug life most commonly prescribes here for men is, hey, look over here. This, of course, only works on those who do not distinguish between looking and staring. Thinking. Consciousness overdressed. <laughs> what can you say about a species who's more interested in their ills than their health, their flaws than in their potential? The basic answer is, of course, creatures in an unfinished state. And need I point out this being why the few always move out of state. And thus it be that the unpublished brochures continue to reveal that all worthwhile travel is internal. On this indefinable itinerary, there are no listings for Wellville or Perfect City in that they would carry with them their own canceling out dichotomous counterparts which are useless to a multidimensional adventurer. Query, to chess pieces, is the board upon which they're played life, their circumstances, fate, God, or just what? Aren't you glad you're not simply a pawn in a game? <laughs> Health check. Reality is not sick. The models of it are. What gifts can a would-be knight offer the king that will win his favor? And what things can a man think that will transform his awareness? At extraordinary times, the ultimate honor can be in desertion, the supreme giving and withholding. The mind runs on gimme, enriched consciousness on a man's undemonstrative comprehension of the equitable distribution of all of life. Seekers of the secret dream of what it is they'll find, while knowers of the secret have, no, have left dream worlds far behind. What seems achievement and gain on one level becomes smoke and mirrors on another. Thus, what does a would-be knight have to offer the king once he realizes that the two are one person sharing a common pocket? <laughs> there was this one ship which had a captain topside and an engineer below, and the captain would say he was in charge and the main lookout. And he seemed to be so, at least whenever he was asked. <laughs> Thinking, direct perception misdirected. <laughs> Simple view time again. People involved in this kind of activity regarding their mind and consciousness are either the silliest people in the world or else the most serious. <laughs> Kind of spooky to consider, huh? <laughs> the only way men can cure their so-called psychological flaws is by coming to realize their actual nature and purpose, which is about as likely as chess pieces overthrowing their board and dismantling it. <laughs> Hip check. Reality doesn't suck. The models of it do. <laughs> Although they're unable to state their intentions plainly, religion is in charge of treating dreams, politics in charge of defending fears, philosophy in charge of dealing with words, and the arts in charge of picking up the rest. So where does that leave activities such as this? Not that anyone who cares will ever know. The original Moses took the promised land seriously. His eldest son, however, had a different perspective on the matter. 
thinking. Awareness with too much makeup. All of the games played by man have a conjectured, con conclu conclusive payoff. At least all of those games conjectured by man, which are the only ones he normally plays. Where they call out imaginary letters and numbers, only imaginary bingo cards are required. <laughs> there was once a tall building that was shaky, and in defiance of all laws of physics, those living on the top floors realized it the least. In the land of the calm and inchoate, one hippopotamus asked another hippopotamus, what do you want to come back as in your next life? And the other hippopotamus replied, mud. <laughs> <laughs> the higher up you go, the higher up you go, but only if you are personally aware of it. And one hippopotamus said to another hippopotamus, God, aren't you glad you aren't a human? <laughs> Men didn't invent cults and secret societies. Their minds naturally are ones. One of the truly underrated aspects of man's unique state of awareness is his ability to function for long periods of time without it. <laughs> huh, you think not? Well, just let a tiger try going for a while without its normal state of tiger consciousness and see how long it survived. <laughs> On one world, the creatures were only conscious whenever they thought about it. The factors normally functioning within a system can never comprehend the system. Those who believe in UFOs are a little late and in error, and that belief has nothing to do with it. All notions of extra systemic forces, gods and the like, arose from man's thought struggling to escape the confinement of his own mind. Futility check. Reality is not impossible to deal with. The models of it are. The mind is such that even if you reach Canaan, it'll still want to think about Egypt. Based upon its frequency of use, the drug most popular with man is in the form of a passing neural fixation. <laughs> Thinking, neural orientation, disoriented. In one land were the knights into two armies divided, the first in charge of slaying all enemies of the king and the other responsible for the killing of themselves should they be foes of the crown found. Now last in our series of reality checks. Reality is not the problem, it's the models of it that provide such a sensation. According to one lost legend, the first man to ever reach a transcendental state of awareness was a certain soccer player who one day floated up off the field and out of the stadium. <laughs> Poof! Gone, just like that. While waiting on the train to Spain, many of the Swiss travelers wanted to be entertained with stories thereof. The real legends and myths are distinguishable from the fake, fake by the fact that you never hear of the real ones. Thinking. The turning down of mental lights. Companionship and a man's state of awareness. Those who sail peacefully on the sea of oblivion never sail alone. And you might ask, is this good news or bad news? And if you have to ask, you'll never understand. Now some literary news. There was once a man who wrote a book he entitled, Hey, Thoughts get lonely too, but no one would publish it since it was already in public domain. <laughs> Only a man with nothing on his mind can be properly serious. <laughs> Thinking, alertness blunted. Only attended stable awareness can deal directly with reality without the intermediary interference of extrinsic models and the ideas of other people. Who but the non-experienced can think of enlightenment as anything other than a strictly personal experience? 
Those after Muhammad pictured paradise as a place where they would all someday meet, while the prophet himself knew it to be a point of focus within each individual. More curios from the binary workings of three-dimensional minds. Those who underrate man are the same ones who overrate him. In the beginning, priests were also grave diggers and kings not immune to their own palaver. Are you beginning to see how it all works and fits? Thinking, a substitute for conscious alertness. In contradistinction to the games normally played by men in which there are believed in rules, measurements, and achievable goals, in the mythical land of knighthood, only sports are pursued on fields constructed to have no boundaries, markers, or goal lines. What, pray tell, does transcendental mean if limited in any way? On this one planet, the creatures were only conscious whenever they said they were. <laughs> Men began telling tales of the great mystical quest long before anyone actually undertook it. And little has changed since then. Let everyone who doesn't get it raise their hand and count off five billion and one. <laughs> um, Whenever his consciousness seemed in danger of settling down and clearing up, one man would take some more drugs. And if none were available, he'd think some more. <laughs> okay, a harmless hint. Perhaps the reason that men can't see the secret of life is because life is the secret. In this one land, the creatures were only conscious whenever they were asked if they were. Big question time. Where do you suppose all these places are? At, anyway? <laughs> to keep from having to worry about the condition of his home, one man seldom stayed there. Does this man sound like anyone you know? One man's directive to himself was, don't be impressed by anything you think. You can enjoy it the first time around, but don't be impressed by it. Attempting to pursue this extraordinary adventure while still here on this planet is like trying to execute checkmate in the midst of a soccer game. <laughs> that will perhaps be the final sports news of the day and will perhaps for the few be all that is necessary. Question, well, if criticism is never of any use, then what kind of thinking is? Answer, hey, your questions are getting better. Proposal number seven, a man should never talk to himself unless he's sure who it really is he's talking to. And don't forget our little game of trying to imagine what a lemon would see living in a yellow world. A more fully realized state of consciousness compared to man's normal thinking processes would be like a silent, stupendously powered, double-headed locomotive placed in the middle of a train to fill up the empty gap that no one ever realized was there. <laughs> A man living by himself can be his own best critic, though he properly alone has no edges left. Mm -hmm. And in one land, the question arose, what is the difference between the unadorned and the enlightened? Thinking, conscious awareness turned away from itself. <laughs> if a valid axiom for the collective is that, you live, then you die, and anything else is just you thinking about it. Then for the few it would read, first you realize that. You live, then you die, and anything else is just you thinking about it. Then you learn to quit thinking about it by learning to think about things other than the things everybody else thinks about. <laughs> you got it? Many of those who followed after Lao believed it to be quite simple, though none but the old man himself fully realized the depth of its simplicity. And lastly, thinking, the common man's version of consciousness. Do you think that was a sufficient number of really extremely expensive cheap shots at thinking? I was going to pick up a little bit, or a lot, 
again from last time concerning the fact that if you begin to see that thinking in a non, underline non-pejorative sense is a contrived game, just simply in the sense that by all ordinary observations, the mental life of, of man, everything that is unique to man's existence, all of society, all of civilization, all the arts, all of religion, everything that you could lump under the title of civilization is vis-a-vis -vis man's physical survival instincts. Everything else compared to that is a contrivance. Once you realize that this contrivance, that civilization itself, man's mental life, is not unlike a game played upon a board, which is easier to talk about than out on a level playing field, but it is like a board game, a chess game, any sort of game. Once you realize that, and you see for yourself that they're all on the same level, that there's no difference between sports and religion, between politics, football, there's no difference between literature, and stock car racing, there's no difference between philosophy and soap operas, then all of the problems that men would use as an excuse if they felt in any way condemned for an improper use of their mind. If someone who could have an influence, an impact on them stood up and denounced the common use of the human intellect, men would defend themselves by saying that although in part that they probably do waste away some of their intellectual energy by such things as television or movies or whatever, they would then say that not all of human activity mentally is expended in such a wastrel type manner. After that, once you believe that the, just picture, I mean, it's not hard, picture that there's a board here. I said chess, I was using chess tonight, but it's of no importance, so that you, I'm not trying to say life's a chess game, it's any kind of game. But the point is, if you picture that that is a board game of some kind, and on it, is all of civilization. On it is everything that is a product, evidently, of man's intellect. Once you understand that, once you can see it, then all of the problems, all of the perceived inequities of life, which is what keeps the game going, the perceived inequities, the perceived injustices, the perceived errors in the game of life, is like the rolling of dice, it is like the shaking of the dice, it is like the shuffling of the cards, it is like the turning over of the cards. Were there not this impression that on this board, on, in this game of life, that there were more important moves, less important moves, within the significant areas of moves, sometimes people erred in judgment, that it was a continuing effort for civilized, reasonable, intelligent people to try straighten out the game, try to bring those who are not abiding by its rules more into line, trying to continually refine the way in which progress is being measured, try to continually reestablish in some collective way that there are goal lines, that there is, that the game is actually going somewhere. And the mainstream of life, the majority of the players, and of course it varies from what appears to be individual pockets within the mainstream to other pockets, which is why we have different nationalities, have different, have the National and American Football League. You have amateur, collegiate, and professional sports. You have various political parties. It is all to help preserve and to codify this appearance of inequities, imbalance, or as to change metaphors in the middle of the screed, as is now popular to say, give the appearance of uneven playing fields. 
there are continual problems. Straighten, I'll simplify myself. The human mind, all civilized, decent people, perceive that there are continuing problems besetting humanity. And there appear to be, without any doubt, singular human problems. We're not talking now about survival. We're talking about a level beyond that. We're not talking about just the fact that there are people going hungry and there are people who do not get a new car every 10 years. And people who do not live in nice homes. We're talking about the intellectual level. That there is a continuing perception that is taken as reality that there are injustices, there are serious flaws, there are inequities, there are imbalances, there are simply problems that man must rectify. This gives the appearance, to use my metaphor now, this gives the appearance that here on this playing field are inordinate bumps, hilly places, or there are places if you're moving the pieces around, there are places where they get stuck, or there are tears in the board. Make up your own metaphors, or if it was actually a playing field, that there are holes, there are places that it goes downhill or uphill and gives somebody an unfair advantage. There are simply problems reflected on the game board. Were it not this perception, amongst other things, but were it not for this kind of perception that human life is not being played on a balanced, even, equitable, fair, unflawed board, the normal intellect would have scant reason to exist, or to put it to you from last time, the game represents a model of reality. And without an affixation to that model, without the mind being a part and parcel of some model or models, which is equitable to the game, it's the same thing, and without the mind operating within the context of a model or a game, then the ordinary intellect, a collective common man, would have very little reason to operate. I'm understating it the way I normally say it is. Within a few days, everybody would become flaccidly, would become terminally intellectually flaccid. Yeah. Or as people in the 60s would probably enjoy, people would almost mellow out of existence. Yeah. That sounds a little too positive. They would are we out of existence? You would just go into, man collectively would go into a larger, more distinct appearing stupor than he is in passing now individually. We would suddenly have five billion or so people lined up on this planet or spread out in such a way that it would look like five billion stunned overworked possum standing in the middle of an interstate. <laughs> Again, it's without all of that. It's simply easy to see you will not get up in the morning intellectually. You would not continue to live a normal, civilized, intellectual life. Did you not? Were you not operating within a model somewhere or a combination of several models in which there are serious as far as you're concerned, without any question, serious perceived shortcomings, flaws, mistakes. The game is not sound. The models in which you operate are not complete. Or put even easier, the mind is never satisfied. They're just wider ways of looking at it. So you're dealing with a model you're dealing with a game that is by its very nature. It's got nothing to do with your thought processes and it has nothing to do with whatever particular games you're playing because your main game could be in religion and yours could be Christianity and someone else's be Islam and someone else's be Judaism and they could appear to be absolutely conflicting, opposed, inequitable, incompatible games. And they're all the same game. But you understand from each view, all Muslims, more or less now, find themselves at absolute loggerheads with Jews. And Jews, more or less, with, uh, or in Muslims also on the other side, with Hindus. You've got all of these games. You've got, in more civilized, less uh, apparently passionate areas, you have in democratic 
countries, you have Republicans railing at Democrats. And if you examine it, you think, well, there's not that much difference. Or politics is politics, whatever your story is. And yet, for that particular model to continue going on, those involved must see some other faction, that is, some other areas of the board, being so flawed, so lacking and propriety as to take up much of their time and energy just trying to correct other people's mistakes, trying to correct the others, trying to level out the inequitable parts of the board, trying in some way to patch up, to treat, if not cure, but to treat the ills of the board. And of course, it's always somebody else's. It's the way it's supposed to be. There's nothing wrong with that. And so the Democrats, the Christians, would both say, well, I could spend a lot more time being Christ-like and democratic-like were it not for the fact that I have to continue to go around trying to pick up after the Jews and the Muslims and the Republicans and trying to take their little heads and say, well, you know, straighten up, look over this way. I have to slap their little hands and say, what are you thinking about? And they all look like, huh? <laughs> I've asked the rhetorical question of why do people not, even, even the most intellectual amongst the ordinary, give any thought to the fact that the problems of man these inequities, these errors, these shortcomings have not changed. The nature of them, the specifics of them have not changed. They have not moved one degree since our earliest history. Whereas everything else, everything that is not having to do with the problems of man, everything else, even by the most stringent stringent measures, everything else has at least progressed some, and by the least stringent, uh, have changed some. But the problems of humanity have not, forget, progressed, that is, progressed toward a cure, they haven't even changed. And men do not notice that. The reason I bring up now the idea of this being a game and the fact that it is played on one board and the perception of the players on the board in the game is that the game is inequitable, that the game, that the rules are either not being followed by all players or else the rules have yet to be established in an equitable way. And no one notices, nor should they, but I want you to notice that no one notices history gives no attention whatsoever to the fact that what, is, what are perceived to be the severe, the salient, singular human problems of today are the same ones that were in place 7,000 years ago in Samaria, in Egypt, in India, in China. The same problems. And as I said, forget, you can forget the idea of we're getting closer to curing them. You've got to be absolutely befuddled to even hesitate in your response because the answer is no. That's not even the good question, no. The good one is not why, not why haven't they reached any or coming closer to being solved is why have not some of them simply disappeared or why have we not gained new ones? After 8,000 years, a person could start off, for instance, if you had a kid born in the land of Pharaoh 8,000 years ago, and let's say the kid was in bad shape, using him allegorically to represent humanity. Let's say he's born with severe acne, pimples, shingles, bad hair, chicken pox, the measles, facial warts. Here we are 8,000 years later, and you would think at least, or you should, I'm asking you rhetorical why men do not, here 8,000 years later, you take the same patient. He has now grown for 8,000 years and he has, well, let me have to repeat them all, he has the same litany of poxes 
ills and afflictions that he had 8,000 years ago. <laughs> now, by any reasonable measure, a reasonable mind should think, well, some of these would have cured themselves. Some of them he would have outgrown, such as chicken pox or mops or acne. And yet here he is, if you want to carry the allegory a little further along, pardon the expression, reasonable lines, we would have now this 8,000-year-old kid would be an 8,000-year-old adult, at least an 8,000-year-old non-kid anymore, and yet he has the same ills. None have dropped. And by the same token, a reasonable mind should think, well, uh, if he's 8,000 years older now, not only should he have lost some of the original afflictions, but just due to his age, the aging process, he should now have new ones. He should have you know, hemorrhoids, very close veins, maybe a hernia or two. <laughs> same thing. He's lost none, he's gained none. But the worst or the best that ordinary minds conceive of, if it's pointed out to them, and then they take it as being ironic or sarcastic or cynical, <laughs> but the best that can be pointed out or made, um, the best that an ordinary mind can be made ephemerally, temporarily aware of is to say, you realize that the so-called problems, the unique singular problems of man that we have not really cured any of them after 8,000 years. And if you'll do it with somewhat of a sneer, you can get many ordinary minds to go, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but that's nothing. <laughs> then if you say, well, how about this? I'll tell you what's stranger than that. And drop any apparent sarcasm. And so I'll tell you what struck me stranger than that is the uh, list of problems of 8,000 years ago and the list of problems of today are a perfect match. No more, no less. We've lost none through attrition, through accident, through natural calamities of some kind, and we've gained none through accident or bad luck. Do you after 8,000 years, it's the same ones? The exact same ones? You can't even get a mind then to even go, huh. Ah. <laughs> they, just, they just turn away and leave. There are two things that can be uh, practical use until you learn to abandon the mind anyway. And then all of this is just you had me wasting my damn time. <laughs> Once you see what's going on in life, then you go, well, you could have saved all those years of talking. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. <laughs> Remember, I told you first. <laughs> There are two things, well, in the, in the means time, of all you Swiss travelers waiting on the train to get to Spain, you still, everyone left to hear tales told thereabouts. See, I changed it from Paris to Istanbul. I think we about wore out the, my mythical Orient Express. Plus, Istanbul's got too many damn syllables sometimes to make, it interferes with the rhythm of certain sentences. Those awaiting the train to Spain. <coughs> In the meantime, what I was going to say is two very potentially real uses of it is, is that the mind, the way it normally operates, uh, from one valid description, operates on the basis of agitation. That's not it. The mind operates whether you're agitated or not, as you should notice by now. Now, those of you who are really advanced students, as you should be sickening <laughs> to know by now. <laughs> but at any rate, the ordinary mind, if you turn to a man, because everybody lives on that certain planet I mentioned. Everybody lives there. There were two news items, whether you put them together or not. Everybody is conscious if you ask them if they are. So. And then plus I point out that there is this one planet wherein all the creatures are conscious whenever they think they are mm -hmm. or whenever they ask they are. So everyone is, everyone is conscious and everyone is outside that unattended stupor level of automatic consciousness whenever they're asked if they are. If you say, I heard that man just, their mind just runs on and on and they just kind of drug along by it and they think they're in charge and 
This, you just think just running along, it's them kind of being drugged along by a runaway horse or something. That can't be true, is it? I mean, I, I'm, for instance, I mean, are you conscious right now? Another guy, anybody on this planet in the mainstream of life will go, well, sure. And they are compared to what they were before you ask. So here and there, everybody is conscious when they're asked if they are. And if you ask them if they are, and, and they could hold that for a second, which I know I'm begging for divine miracles, but if they could hold it for a couple of seconds, if you said, can you hold that condition just for a second? You know, can you grunt and really hold on? They go, all right, I'll try. And you went, all right, compared to what you are aware of right now internally about your own processes up here. He goes, yeah, yeah. Compared to that, think, just be aware of what the mind was doing just before I asked you that. Of course, that's enough to throw him back into it, but like I said, we're, we're, we're operating under the cover of divine, unbelievable miracles for me to describe this. So he goes, okay, you go, your mind was, you were aware of what it was up to just before I asked you that question, if you were conscious and you said, yeah. And so the guy goes, yeah, yeah. And you go, what would you say about, what seemed to be the impetus? What seemed to be the drive, the energy for that? Of course, he wouldn't have this much intelligence, but I'm giving you a genuine, a fair description. If we had long enough to discuss it with ordinary mind, he would find if I said, well, how about this seems to be just running off agitation? I'll take credit and say, he would finally go, that's it. That, that's as good. I'll, you know, and then he could go back to, to stupor. But if I insisted that he hold it until he could give me an answer. So now back to you. All you got to do is at any given time, you become aware of the fact that you haven't been aware of the fact for hours, days, whatever. And there it is. It's like you turn and look, and it's this out of control freight train. It's like as soon as you try and look, it's like it's always going out the door in another room of your house up here. That just as soon as you were aware of the fact, you see the tail end of it, and then it's like the door slams. <laughs> the memory is so short at that level because consciousness is so weak and memory is so weak, but you get the tail end of what was going on, and it doesn't matter what it was. It's only philosophers and psychiatrists that believe the actual what was going on matters. Only people who get out and count cars only damn bureaucrats and statisticians. What's going on in traffic is not the problem. See, it's not reality is the problem, it's the damn models of it. And this model of it is people thinking what goes on in my mind is of importance, and it's just a game. And it doesn't matter that your game seems to be different than the guy next to you, they're both at the same level. But back to, if you look around real quick, and you, you try to catch well, what was going on in my mind, about all you can get. It's just like weak, just faint, like somebody just suddenly turned off the radio. You know how it goes, you can turn off the radio as fast as electricity is. And actually when you hear it go snap, if you listen, you can always hear a couple of milliseconds of the song go on. In the same way that you're trying to light. And you've still got an impression of light, even after electricity, the power is withdrawn from it. You pull yourself out of the flow of ordinary mental traffic. And it's like it just, the thing right at the door, and the tail end of it, you can see its ass, the tail end of the caboose or whatever was going on where you cut it off going out the door and it just slams and it's, it's so weak, you, it's all you can do. You can start piecing it sometimes if you want, it's just mental exercise in a sense. You can expand backwards a little more, but then it just gets so weak you can't even tell what it is. But what I was going to say can be of practical significance is, is when you realize, when you see yourself, that everything that the mind normally does is operating at the same level and it's all operating on the basis that it's agitated. That if you could see it over a long enough period of time, if you could stop right now, withdraw yourself, extract yourself from being simply this automatic flow of uncontrollable traffic, if in some way you could stand aside from it and let it still go and you could still watch it over some period of time and you had to ask yourself, or if I said try it as an experiment, and you, and you started seeing what it was your mind was up to. The kinds of thoughts are going, and you can do this, you just have to piece it together by keep trying to look and look and look, and finally, you can, as I said, you can run it, you can expand your memory a little bit backwards, more than what you just at first glimpsed. But it gets very weak. But then you keep putting together these little weak snippets of it. Anyway, you get an impression of what your mind normally does. 
in far, insofar as exact things, and you begin to want to write notes down, well, why do I keep thinking about women? Why do I keep thinking about money? You know, does this have some significance psychologically? None. It's not that. It's not to analyze it, but it, you just get an, a wider impression of what your mind keeps churning, or what churns out over and over completely, totally throughout your mind, and then to ask yourself, well, what motivates this? Again, forgetting that there's some psychological significance specifically, you just think, well, what is it? Because you, what you finally come to, if you're wired up correctly to be interested in such as this, you come up on your own without me telling you that you realize. It's not just an instant flash. I don't know how, anyway. You finally realize, without me continuing to harp on it, that the specifics of what your mind thinks, is anything less than of no importance? Yeah. Sometimes I draw a blank and I just, at any rate, if there is, consider that's what it is, but you suddenly see for yourself that it is moot, that that has no significance whatsoever. So then, as hard as this is, fall it for one more second and I'll let go, is then to ask yourself, in my suggestion, well, that being the case, that I can't find any significance whatsoever, or contrary, it strikes you, there is none. You don't have to look any further. It's just something that goes on. And then, at my urging, if you tried to consider, well, how would I describe this? What, in what way, if I were actually responsible? If my mind, in some way, I was responsible and I've got my mind going and through whatever things I did in my childhood, you know, combined with some of the effects and the impacts of my childhood, but if all this in some way contributed to me having a truly individual mind and now I look at what goes on in my so-called individual mind, and I see that as far as it having anything to do with me individually, it's foolish. I mean, I can't, it is untenable to think that anymore. So then if you took my suggestion and tried to ask yourself, then what is it? How would I describe, I keep doing it, or it keeps happening inside of me. If I had to try and describe, well, what, what would appear to motivate it? What would make any sense? Since it's meaningless, since I see that, then if at the same time, or on the other hand, if I tried to, had to describe to myself, since what I'm doing is meaningless, impertinent to me personally, then if I'm going to attribute some motivation to it, then what possible motivation could it be? Finally, back to, I was going to suggest agitation. All right, this is not a cheap simile. This is an expensive simile. <laughs> Physically, let's take something physical. You're sitting there with your legs crossed and you do this number. Or you're sitting there right now with your feet on the floor and you're doing this. Now you could take all kinds or you could attempt all kinds of descriptions of that. You could say, well, you don't get enough exercise or you're having muscle spasms. But everybody sits around and you do things like that. And you could turn to somebody and say, well, why do you keep, you know, sitting there going? And the person could be listening to you intently, or they could be in a class studying some challenging, intellectually challenging subject, and you see them, though. You got everybody sitting there in the room. Somebody's doing this, and other people are just, they keep going. And you say, why do you do that? And I forget all these would-be psychological or, you know, psychological explanations. You could say, well, you don't get enough exercise, and et cetera. No, oh, okay. But I got a better one. Let's be plain and blunt. You're agitated. The body is always agitated. To try and, you can take that sometime. Years ago I used it for another reason of observing all the people's physical tics and quirks. Trying to observe them in people is not much of a challenge. The real challenge is find someone that has none. Because you look around or look at you, and your body is continually wanting to do something. And so if we turned it away from you observing other people and we turned on you and go, well, why do you keep trying to point out that it's mostly people who seem to be out of shape that really fidget the most? And you tried to explain, well, uh, it's their body trying to say, by God, get up and run, get some exercise, or you get too much sleep, or you're getting leg cramps from just sitting around. Why do you keep saying about other people, and you claim to be in good shape, you claim to be an exemption, an exception to what you're describing, but there you are doing it. And the person looks down, and sure enough, there you are going. <laughs> the point being that if, then if they were trying to be sincere and obvious 
in their observation, you say, well, how do you explain why you do it? And there is no explanation other than the fact I just did it. Like so what, the body, I guess it just kind of, since you still have the spark of life in you, that just the body is just inclined to be agitated. It's not anything unusual. If you're not actually doing something like this, you're continually shifting position, even if it's not physically observable to somebody, that you keep shifting your weight from one, if you're sitting down, from one cheek to the other cheek, you know, shift the, from some of the weight from shoulder height from one side to the other, you straighten your back a little, the body stays agitated. I could use other words, but let's use that. That's good as any. The mind operates ordinarily, the ordinary thought processes operate on a basis of agitation. The lungs want to breathe or they'll die. The heart wants to pump blood or it will die. You will die physically. The mind wants to think. This is a very, may I say, piss poor description, but it's the best in the world. The mind wants to think. It does not want to die. And the mind almost is as self-defensive, as strange as it might sound to some people the first time, as the body is. You don't believe that? All right, try, here's a quick experiment. See if you can hold your breath for a second. <laughs> and of course you can. And what you're doing is temporarily killing. You're threatening with death. You're withdrawing life from your respiratory system. That is from your body. I mean, it's a form of suicide if it goes far enough to go, and you can do it. All right, now stop your mind. No. <laughs> Just, I thought you, some of you might find it interesting because at first you might think, especially from some of the maps and descriptions I've given, that, that the body itself is, when it comes to survival instincts, would be the leader. And that the mind just sort of a later Johnny or Mary come lately, and which it sounds, it fits. It fits all the kinds of paradigms and models I have drawn. But consider. You can stop your heartbeat, you can hold it, you can hold your breath, you can do all sorts of things that would spell, carried to an extreme, would spell death to the body. In other words, you're committing suicide. You can do it, you can go. <laughs> but you can't do it to the mind. It's as though the mind will resist suicidal efforts even more strenuously than will more physical aspects, such as the heart and the lungs, the entire body. But. There's a feeling of agitation. That's the word I was trying to use tonight and have obviously succeeded at least if we're going to judge it by the process of reputation. <laughs> the mind runs by agitation. Now you're gonna have to take this simply. Or I'm gonna make it simple without stirring it up anymore. If you see, if we accept what I'm describing, that you can see for yourself a few people that the operations of the mind are almost unstoppable. Now, the operations of the mind, that is just what you normally think, once seen, once there is a general awareness of what generally happens in your mind and you see that it has no personal significance, it is moot, meaningless, impertinent, useless, and yet there it is, and as much a part of you in one sense, even more so, even more defensive of itself than your breathing is. And once you see that, and then you ask, well, if my mind, if I was in charge, and my mind is being run for some reason, and I see what's going through it, has no reason, has no purpose, and yet it happens, then why the hell does my mind do it? And tonight I was trying to suggest to you that one description would be agitation in the same way Now, would you say, well, what's the, what's the purpose in somebody sitting there in their chair and making and their leg keeps bouncing? You say, what's the purpose in that? I mean, it's not enough exercise that if indeed it's your body reacting adversely to being sedentary so much that it's driving it crazy, then that's not going to help. Yeah. You can say, well, what's the purpose of it? And you could answer, well, it's agitation. It's, I mean, it's just the reaction to just being agitated. 
that the body is always, in a sense, agitated because the body, in a sense, is always out of equilibrium, which is don't why, you know, if it was in perfect symmetry, you would inhale once, and you'd go, hey, that's it, and then you'd die. <laughs> or you'd eat one meal and go, well, am I full? Yes, I am, and that's it, and you'd die. It is always out of balance. It's like a running contest trying to stay alive, and you're just trying to die at the same time. You have to watch it. <laughs> and, so, and so, well, that's what I mean by the body being agitated. Right? The mind, once you see what I'm describing, if you see it in this way, that what's going on, that the content, the cargo of this vehicle, of the mind, that what's in there just seems to be slop, useless, going nowhere, repetitive, redundant, just every nasty thing, every useless adjective you can think of applies to it, and you think, and yet it goes nonstop. What would be driving it? Agitation. Now, I said I was going to point out something that could be of practical usage before you ever get to Spain, before you ever get to the point that you can stop. Whatever it is. <laughs> then what could be a practical value, a use, is this agitation has an intellectual self-justification. That if you could get an ordinary person to hear what I just said, and momentarily to them, if you could in some way give them a big snapshot or a big film strip of the movie of their mind over the last, for their lifetime, and they looked at it and they could hold some impartial view of it over several minutes or 30 seconds and realize that you're right. If that is the workings of my mind, you know, it's just a useless, it's a meaningless cesspool. I, should, I don't mean that it's bad. You just say it's meaningless. Well, stop. Well, that makes it too easy to get out of it that you just look at and go, well, that's meaningless. That has nothing to do with me. That, it's just meaningless. It's impertinent to me. But yet there it is. And then if I could get them to say, all right, then it, you kind of wonder, well, why do I do it? What makes the mind operate? You, and then they say, yeah, I do. And I could say, well, you could describe it as like a form of agitation. It is like this continuing battle of the man physically being out of equilibrium, always trying to stay alive, having to eat, and then having to digest food, and having to eliminate food, having to get hungry again, and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, all right, there's a similar situation in the mind. And they go, okay. And so it is a continuing process of being first this way, then that way, and this way. And it's, so it's just a form of agitation. It's never at peace. The body, I know maybe nobody was expecting the word agitation, but still with the body, you understand the body is agitated in the sense that it can never be satisfied totally or you'd be dead. So that's what I mean by agitation. It's always, and it varies from place to place. You can satisfy hunger and then the agitation may be in the need for sleep and rest. Or you can satisfy that and agitation might be for thirst. And you satisfy that, slake your, your thirst, and it could be agitation sexually. It is always some agitation. And if all of them seem to be more or less calmed, then you get to that. If I could get the person to look at this film strip and get a, an overall view of what their thinking has consisted of and uh, what it generally consists of, and they were stuck for, well, you're right, I can't see a purpose in me doing that. And I'd say, all right, it's agitation, it's the mind attempting because it's always feeling like it's getting out of balance. It's always striving to, to arrive at some state of equilibrium. Then, what I was getting at <laughs> is it has its own intellectual justification, although people normally never think this way. Really? <clears throat> <laughs> because, back to the game, is it does not look at itself as being out of balance and striving for unachievable, con constant equilibrium it looks out at life itself, the model of what the mind calls reality, and it sees the model. It sees the game board, the playing field, being out of balance. That is the inequities, the injustices, the errors, the stupidity of the game. And so therefore, the mind, without it ever analyzing this way, finds its state of being agitated and never any relief that the things that agitate it, the so-called problems of man, are not only not cured, they're not even a little treated. They're unchanged for the history of, of man. 
But the justification, without any analyzation, but it operates, it still happens, is that this agitation that runs normal thinking is justified on the basis that if I still, hang with me a second, I had this ordinary man that I described and did the hand gesture for, and he considered, yeah, that's my thinking, and I don't see why, and you say it's agitation. And if he fought all that, just for the sake of theory, his feeling would still be, whether he could vocalize it or not, his feeling would still be that, all right, even if it is just agitation by God, there is justification in it because look at the damn state of man. Yeah. That if you won't, he could say to me or think to himself, well, if you won't call that agitation running my thinking, well, by God, you know, that's not bad because I am agitated. I'm a concerned person. I'm a right thinking human because the models that he has, the models in which he operates, that he defines reality, that he sees the game being, it is never equitable. It is never without people cheating. It is never without people even out there on the same board trying to play a different game. Exactly. You're trying to play chess and somebody else is trying to play Chinese checkers. Yeah. Or you're trying to play chess and somebody else is not using the rules correctly. And so the mind feels, although it does not analyze it verbally in this way, but it feels this meaningless agitation that would, could be described with some validity as being the fuel that drives it is agitation. Just simply, things are not right. And it will go around and around in a circle since the problems cannot be changed, they are never changed, they have, and nobody knows it's not changed. Then the mind finds nothing at all untoward or unusual for the fact that it keeps going round and round and round over things that have no pertinence to it. <laughs> Do you ever begin to see how it all fits? It could not be a more perfect fit. Mm -hmm. It's only ordinary, intelligent, educated, reasonable, logical people who look at life and say, well, the damn thing doesn't make any sense. <laughs> if it made any more sense, you'd gag on it. <laughs> well, I guess that was my final cheap shot for the night. I give you the expensive shot, or the reasonably priced shot. <laughs> People say life doesn't make any sense. If it made it more sense, here's the danger, people would see what it was. Mm -hmm. I'd like to leave you with my harmless hint for the night that was in the news item, that perhaps the 